Well, good morning and welcome to Worship Foothills family, whether you're here in person or online. Uh, I'm Pastor Tim, part of the pastoral team, and we look forward to celebrating our faith in worship today. If you're new or joining us for the first time today, I always like to say you may come as a visitor, but we want you to leave as our friend. If you're here in person out in the lobby, there's a welcome cards. If you have any questions about uh, our church family, the facilities, please uh, go there. Also, uh, if you're new to Foothills over the last while, uh, every month we have what's called a starting point class. And we would invite you to sign up uh, at the uh, cart in the lobby. It's a time uh, on October the 10th when we'll just do some orientation about what it means to be part of uh, this church family as well. I don't know about you, but as I've sort of just been meditating upon uh, the, the screen this morning, you know, God in the dark, I don't know about you, but there just been, seems to be this sense of oppression these days now that, you know, this fourth wave has ramped up and now we're physically distancing and we're all back with our masks, we've moved the chairs back and things like that. It, it seems like, you know, we're just taking one step forward and now three steps back and we just feel the weight of this again. I would suggest there's no better place uh, than right now to just come and sit at the feet of Jesus, as it were, to imagine yourself, as it were, entering into the gates of heaven. That's what worship does for us, to give worship to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The psalmist says, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And I will say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen? This is the day that the Lord has made. And we together now will rejoice and be glad in it because in him we are one. Let's worship together. Please stand as we worship. Son of God, one with our sister, one with our brother, one family by the blood. Make us one, make us one. together now and forever Jesus be glorified make us one
so much for the opportunity we have to gather here and worship you. You love us so great, Lord. In our darkest moments, in the most difficult times, you love us more than anyone ever could and anyone ever will. You love us. So we gather here and we worship you because that's all that we can do, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name.
Just want to bring you up to date on what I call our Family Matters uh, church announcements for the coming week. Because of COVID, there, there are some changes, and we'll, uh, I'll try to work through these as well. But before I do, uh, since 2012, uh, two members of our uh, staff, our faith journey that have really enriched us, uh, their, their season of ministry on our staff team has concluded in past days. Uh, Rebecca Schnell, who's been our uh, director and our team lead for Creative Arts, and also Al Wilms, who stewarded our building as the team lead for our operations. Uh, when COVID allows us as a staff, we're going to meet with them and thank them. But I just wanted to pause, and on behalf of our leadership team, the elders and our staff, just wanted to say thank you, a heartfelt thank you, and honor uh, Rebecca and Al today. Uh, what can we say about Rebecca? She is so talented, uh, not only on the stage, but behind the scenes. I, I think Rebecca's ministry, uh, she started nine years ago this month. As it were, she, she opened a window to heaven to allow us through the arts to encounter God afresh and anew. Uh, she is talented with beyond belief and her passion that, that just exuded out in, in everything that she did and everything that she touched and the team that she developed that will carry on the excellence of her ministry with us as well. Uh, we want to thank her. Uh, Rebecca really allowed us to celebrate God by, as it were, pulling back the curtains and experiencing God like we never have before. So we just want to pause and thank Rebecca for her ministry and uh, the legacy that she has left to the very high standard of what it means uh, through creative arts to experience God as well. That was a lot of you. Yeah, let, let, let's clap. That was wonderful. And if there's a thousand people in the room this morning, we, it would sound a lot louder, but we can pull up the, put up the, the volume on, on that as well. Uh, for Al Wilms, Al started just 10 years ago. Many of you don't know Al, but he's been the one who, it's, who has really stewarded this uh, facility, the, this beautiful building that God has entrusted to us. He's kept his hand on the pulse of this place. Uh, he's the one who has developed a facility a team that will carry on, like, like Rebecca, a, a level of excellence. But Al was the guy who basically was up in the middle of the night when the alarm went off and the, and, uh, the fire department called someone to come. He was also the guy with the uh, snow shovel up on the roof where things were piling up in places that they shouldn't. Al always seemed to be around this place, and as he enters retirement, uh, we just want to thank Al for the way that he tenderly and hum humbly looked after this, this, this wonderful facility that we've, we call our church building, our church home. And Al has been central, as has Rebecca, in the experience of our faith and our journey together. So put your hands together for Al. And we pray God's continued abundant blessing on both of their lives in these days, in the, in the journey that, that lays ahead for them as well. Now, because of COVID and added restrictions, man, <laughs> this, just this way to uh, just pray for our, our, our staff in these days who have had to immediately pivot certain things. For instance, on the 29th, the, uh, the seniors luncheon now has to be deferred. And also, in terms of the taste of foothills, next Sunday we're going to be showcasing all of our ministries, and we've had to defer that as well uh, to another time. This past Tuesday, our staff did get to have a farewell luncheon for Pastor Ian, who is back in town this week. Uh, but with great regret, we have to postpone his um, farewell, his public farewell this afternoon. There's so many people who had signed up, it's, we just can't do it. So. But we will do it at some point. But until the end of this month, uh, we're continuing to receive love offerings uh, for Pastor Ian. You don't need to put your name on a check, his name on the check or anything. They're just listed it as a love offering. All the love offerings that come in this month uh, will go uh, towards a love gift uh, to Ian and the Trigg family as well. Now, this Wednesday morning, uh, because we do have a large facilities, we are able to do some physical distancing. Uh, and so some of our women's Bible studies will still meet here at 9.30. Others will be online. And also, we just saw that uh, video for Alpha. Uh, Brother uh, Jerry, who's going to speak in a few minutes. I call him the Alpha-holic. He's the Alpha-holic of all times. <laughs> uh, do you believe that people can meet Jesus online? Do you, do you really believe that? I, I was watching... 
television this week, and apparently every 14 minutes there's a love connection on uh, eHarmony. Did you know that? Do you believe that online people can encounter and meet Jesus Christ in a personal way? I, I sure do. Through Jerry's ministry, that now Alpha has to go back online, and you can sign up for Alpha and the starting point out in the lobby or go online there as well. Uh, God will use whatever means it will take to expose people to who Jesus is, what this thing called faith in Jesus is all about. And so Alpha is going to be back online, unfortunately, but God will use it forcefully. So continue to pray uh, for Carl and I as we co-lead the church and for our staff as we're pivoting one way or another in these days. And as we do, uh, we just pray that God will continue to reveal himself afresh and anew. And I'm going to offer a pastoral prayer just now. Let's bow together. Wherever your heart is right now, Jesus feels your pain, your anxiety, your pleasure in life, perhaps. Jesus walks with you. His spirit is in you by faith. And holy God, this morning as we pause in your presence, we just lift up the cares on our hearts and those in our family to you just now. We cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And by the sweet ministry of your spirit around us and within us, we feel your presence with us today. And as we turn our hearts towards you, we feel your pleasure in our hearts today as well. And Father, in these days with so many question marks and in a world that pulls us apart, we thank you because we can still get to know you better. We can learn what it means to belong to you and to each other, even in these unusual times. Father, there's a big election tomorrow night. The future of the country will be placed in the hands of a party that seems to know what to do. At least they tell us all these promises. Oh, may they all just fall at your feet, Jesus. there's ever a time our country needed you, it's right now. With a conviction of good leadership, submitting to the authority that you will give them. So visit us as a country. Visit us as a city. As COVID things out of control again. But you're still on the throne of all creation and all things are in control when we look to you. So as Jerry comes to preach a little later, and as we sing more songs of our faith, may we know you better. May we love you more deeply. And we, may we be more committed to the cause to which you've called us. In Jesus' name, and for his sake we pray. Amen and amen. Please stand if you're able to.
Well, good morning. <laughs> Spread out. Beautiful. So great to see you. So glad that we can still be here, uh, such as it is. So welcome you here this morning. Uh, I want to start by asking you a question. It might sound a little obscure at first, but it'll make more sense as we carry on here. Are you feeling like a tulip this morning? <laughs> I guess we have at least one. Or are you feeling like an oak tree? That's a question that we've used in our home ever since, well, since we, our girls were small. It's kind of a whimsical way of seeing where everybody's at, and then we can treat them in a certain way, you know. And some days we feel like oak trees. We're strong, we're firm, uh, we're rooted, we're optimistic, we can handle anything. And then other days we feel a little more like a tulip, kind of vulnerable and soft, weepy. I mean, you look at me the wrong way and I'll cry. <laughs> But that little metaphor it has helped us uh, through the roller coaster of emotions of life, and it was especially helpful when our daughters were teenagers, as you can imagine. Well, I bring all this up because I know that in a crowd this size, and in times like these, there are more than a few tulips in this room or watching online. And I want to speak to you in your fragility for the next half hour. Or shall I say, let's let God's work speak to you through a story which I am so glad that God included in his holy Bible. It's the story of Elijah, who had more than his share of oak tree days. He was one of the greatest prophets and the most powerful miracle workers in history. He caused the rain to cease for over three years. He brought a widow's son back to life, part of the Jordan River. I mean, at first glance, every day it was an oak tree day. For Elijah. This guy's solid. And so you would think that a spiritual giant like this would never struggle with his faith, right? <laughs> well, let's see. Elijah lived in the ninth century before Jesus, the time that Israel was divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom was ruled by two vicious leaders, King Ahab and his ruthless, vile, evil wife Jezebel, who actually made a sport of killing prophets. And God sends his man, Elijah, the only prophet left at this point, to go and warn them of impending doom if they continue their evil ways and don't follow the one true God. The showdown, the epic showdown, is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 18. If you want to open your Bible to 1 Kings 18 and 19, those are the narratives that we're going to unpack. And in chapter 18, 450 pagan priests of Baal call to their pagan gods for an entire day to burn their altar, burn up the sacrifice, and nothing happens. And then evening comes, and it's Elijah's turn. And so he steps forward, and he thoroughly soaks his altar three times, including the trench around it. And then he calls on the God of Israel, and instantly fire falls from heaven and consumes the entire sacrifice. And the one true God won that encounter, and thousands of people repent, they turn away from their pagan gods, and they turn on the prophets of Baal. It's a very good day to be Elijah. It's an oak tree day, another one. And then he called on the heavens, and the drought ended. The rain fell after three and a half years. And so at the end of the day, at the end of chapter 18, verse 46, the scriptures say, the power of the Lord was upon Elijah. You think? And then this, two verses later, this isn't the typo. Our passage for today, and it's the same guy, 1 Kings 19, verses 3 and 4. Let me read it for you. Elijah was terrified and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left a servant there and went a day's journey into the wilderness by himself. And he came to a broom bush, and he sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he lay under the tree and he fell asleep. It's an oak tree one day, and is a tulip the next. Go figure. Oh God, we are such a good team to, oh God, where are you? Which is where today finds many of you, truth be told. So let me pray for us before we continue. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for giving us this honest, real-life account of brokenness and hope. Uh, we, we really need to hear it today because with all Elijah's deep connections with God, 
in his almost daily affirmation of his presence and power, he still struggled to trust you, just like some of us. And that makes him someone we want to know, especially in these dark, uncertain times. Someone that we can learn from, you know, someone who, just like us, who face similar disappointments and depression that we battle, and yet somehow he climbed out of the cave and the darkness and into your life. And you will lead us in like manner today, Lord. We trust you for that, and we be grateful. So gently turn our heads towards your light, towards your grace, and towards your hope. And we wait upon you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin uh, this morning by offering a few thoughts and reflections about depression before we unpack this narrative. So just forget that these verses are about Elijah, the ones that I just read. This is a person, forget it's Elijah, he's terrified, he runs for his life, he looks for a dark place to hide, and he has suicidal thoughts. Now, if you didn't know that was Elijah, you conclude that this guy is in trouble. By any other description, this is a man who is suffering from severe depression. Disclaimer, it's a difficult topic to talk about. If I have not been exposed to it in a number of variations throughout my life, I wouldn't even touch it. But it's real, and we need to talk about it. Depression has been defined as a sunken place. It's a depression. It's pressed down. It's a valley. It's a dip in an otherwise level landscape. Emotionally, it's addiction, sadness, gloom. And it can be mild, it can be manic, it can be bipolar, temporary, chronic. I mean, it has many faces, many nuances. In any case, it's a scary place to be, mild or severe. And it's a place that many of us will visit on some relative level from time to time throughout our lives. In the Bible alone, you see some of our biblical heroes with depression, Moses, Jonah, Jeremiah, David, Paul, and then lots of other people that we admire uh, went through periods of deep, dark depression. Sir Winston Churchill said, depression followed me around like a black dog all my life. William Styron, the novelist, said, the gray drizzle of horror induced by depression takes on the quality of physical pain. And Charles Spurgeon, greatest preacher in history, <laughs> suffered from severe depression. On more than one occasion, the deacons of his church had to actually go to his home and carry their pastor into the pulpit. And I think sometimes in church, maybe we have been conditioned to believe that if we have our lives together, you know, if we're really committed and we try harder and we had more faith and we did more, that we won't experience this kind of thing. Elijah tells a different story. Depression is real. And you need to know that your problems are not a symptom of your lack of faith or spirituality. Depression is as real as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease, and mental illness is just as real and debilitating as any physical illness or injury. The causes may be harder to pinpoint, and the symptoms harder to treat and to medicate, but this only makes depression more insidious and powerful in its subtlety. It's the number one health problem in the world. It causes more deaths than cancer each year, and ranking as the leading cause of disability, alcoholism, drug abuse, and other addictions. And sadly, Untreated depression is the number one cause of suicide. Now, of course, not all depression gets that desperate or debilitating. There are certain levels of tulip days that are a normal part of life. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says there's a time to laugh, a time to cry. There's a time to mourn, a time to dance. And so life is going to have these ups and downs, these lows and highs, as we vacillate between these two poles constantly. I mean, I can get depressed if I miss a short putt. And I can have a tulip day if the sun doesn't shine for two or three days. And sometimes, for no apparent reason, I can just have a tulip day, and my wife will say, what's the matter? And I say, I don't know. I just feel sad today. And these are the normal emotional and spiritual fluctuations of life. Now, that said, there are times when the brain and the chemicals become so out of balance that a deeper, prolonged clinical depression may occur. And if you're snapping out of, not snapping out of your blues, and the four telltale signs, the signals, the red flags that I'm going to talk about through Elijah's life, in a moment, if they don't go away, you need to seek help. You know, if an Elijah moment, or a tulip day, and I'll use those two terms interchangeably, 
become a week or a month or two months or three months, pick up the phone. Alert a friend. Call us. Reach out. All right. To the passage we go. With these thoughts in mind, let's look at what happens. When depression comes to this child of God, <clears throat> excuse me, what he did and what God did, and see if we can learn about ourselves and about God when we face discouragement. Four telltale signs or red flags that we're having an Elijah moment or a tulip day. First thing is we run away. Verse 3, chapter 1, 1 Kings, or 1 Kings 19. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. So in chapter 18, we saw Elijah, soldier of God, bravely running into battle, fire falling, Baal crumbling, prophets slain, dancing in the streets, ending a three-year drought. And then we come to 19, verse 3. And Elijah, same guy, is still running, but he's running away this time. He's in retreat. What happened? Well, Jezebel, and just picture Cruella de Vil. That's how I, whenever I read this, that's who I see. Cruella de Vil gets wind of her defeat, and she just goes ballistic. And word gets to Elijah that she's coming after him, and he's a dead man. And hard as it is to believe, just hearing that she's after him is the last straw for Elijah. It's the straw that broke the camel's back, and it puts him over the edge. You know, Jezebel's not going to hurt him. I mean, God's clearly on his side. He just proved it over and over and over again. Even before Mount Carmel... Miracles followed this guy around his entire life. Jezebel should be a an, non-issue. Yet it only took this one threat, and he instantly caved in. And you know, and, and there are many here who will test, particularly those who are in leadership, spiritual leadership, but not exclusively, that depression often comes on the heels of an emotional or spiritual high. You know, you give it your all, you empty your tank, you get overtired, you don't think rationally, and everything's too big. And so you run. And Elijah didn't run to his fridge or his liquor cabinet or his gaming computer or a two-day Netflix binge. The only escape he saw was 150 kilometers of desert. And so he leaves Israel and he runs all the way to the southern border of Judah. That's like running from here to Red Deer. I mean, how long did that take? He's probably still running. <laughs> I know what that's like because I come from a very flat place called Saskatchewan, Go Riders. That's so flat you can watch your dog run away for a month, right? <laughs> still gets a laugh. But the point is we're talking several months. This isn't just overnight. He's running away from an empty thread and finally collapses under a tree, and he's hit rock bottom. And some of you have hit some low points through this pandemic. Can I get an amen or a hand? Yeah. <laughs> Um, lots of tulip days. And it leaves us feeling, well, let's give it a name. It's called grief. You know, we're feeling different kinds of losses and griefs, if you will. The loss of normalcy, jobs in some cases, postponed surgery, income, previous lifestyle, eating out, playing sports, travel, trips to see your grandchildren, in-person classes, Hugs, handshakes. I mean, there's this collective chronic mourning that our lives will never be the same again. And we as a society are not used to this kind of prolonged collective grief hanging in the air like a global wet blanket. And it's everywhere. I was in Phoenix, you know, three weeks ago. Landed, the blanket's there too. In conversations, and just, it's just in the air. And how many times have you thought over the last 18 months, it's been 18 months now, have you thought like Elijah, Lord, I can't tell you one more thing. You know, when COVID first started, and I stood down there in Rundle <clears throat> for a Holy Spirit day away for Alpha, and I started turning people away. I had no idea this would keep going on and on. And then we canceled, and we went on Zoom, and it worked out pretty good. And then we did another course, and it was good. And we did four Alpha courses, and they were awesome. But at, by the time it was over, I started thinking, you know, this is really good, but it's getting old. We need up close and personal. We need food. And then we started canceling our flights to see our grandkids or our grandchild in Arizona. Four of them. And then many of you started getting sick in April. Some of you were in, you know, in the hospital with you know, breathing apparatus. And then COVID came to our house. My daughter. Oh. 
and me. And, um, you know, <clears throat> so safe to say that a tulip is delivering your message today. <laughs> But when I loaded my wife up on the ambulance and shipped her off to the ER, I, I didn't know if I'd ever see her again. And, um, and then our daughter in Arizona got COVID, and our not even two-year-old granddaughter tested positive. And hardly a day went by, you know, we would sit and look at each other, and we still do, and say, God, please, not one more thing. I can't take one more thing. And then this week's fourth wave, watching all the new restrictions, and I looked up at God, and I said, are you serious? Had a conversation with some some of the staff here about Alpha you know, decided we got to go back online. I've got to tell you, I went out to my car and I cried. So disappointed. And I felt like the psalmist did in Psalm 55, 6, where he said, I wish that I was like a bird so I could just fly away and get some rest. <laughs> just want to escape. And so we run. And only you know where you're running. It's unique to you. But we all have a place. Anywhere to get away for a while. But anyway, it's a telltale sign, so watch for it. Because when you run, you cut yourself off from other people, which is a second sign. When he got to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Not only does he leave his servant, but he also chose to separate himself from other friends. He could have run too. Because verse 18 tells us that there were still 7,000 people who had not um, uh, worshipped Baal, and they were following the true God. So he could have run to them. He could have run to any one of their houses for community, for lodging, for support, for protection and safety, but he didn't. He chose to go alone. He made that choice. And discouragement often does that to us. And sometimes we tend to withdraw emotionally and physically and spiritually, and we shut people out of our lives, and we even push some people away, family and professionals sometimes, who we know can help, but we're not going there. And the more we withdraw, the worse we feel. And you know, Stop going to church gathering for 18 months. Some people haven't been to church for 18 months for all kinds of reasons. But it gets lonely. It gets lonely. And depression feeds on loneliness and withdrawal. The Global News uh, a few weeks ago had a report and it said 45% of Canadians are desperately lonely. 45% of you sitting here today are lonely. Virtually all research on depression concludes that if we have no real social life, and daily interaction with others, we are more likely to be depressed. Without relationships, we wither to fail and thrive and to defeat depression and come out of our caves. We need each other more than ever. I was talking to Tim on Friday about On Ramp, which is starting at 10.30. And I said, are you going to postpone On Ramp for people to get into small groups today at 10.30? He says, all right, we can't do it. We need it. People need community now more than ever. And if you're feeling a tulip, you need a place where you can go where some oak trees are so they can lift you up and build you up and vice versa. So go to on-ramp. If you're not in a small a life group, go on on-ramp today at 1030. You need the community. We were not meant to go it alone, and God builds his kingdom relationally. And there's no better place to walk out of our depression and our dark places than in the company of others. And yet the current obstacles and restrictions, they're limiting. And so pray for us, as Tim said. I said it so well as we enter another season of uncertainty in ministry. And you need to know that we as a staff, we obsess over this because we know how much you need the close-up contact and it's a challenge for us. So pray for us as we negotiate, you know, stuff we've never had to in our past. We start to run. We cut ourselves from, uh, off from other people. Third thing we do is we start comparing. So Elijah says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Where did that come from? Why is he comparing himself to his ancestors? Well, I suspect somewhere around kilometer 20, so if you're using that red deer image, somewhere around Airdrie, the old inner dialogue started. He's got nobody else to talk to, so he's hashing this stuff up in his, in his own mind. So a couple of days, Elijah's a rock star, and now he's depleted and he's empty, and his enemies are enraged and they're empowered and resourced, and the tables are turned and he's thinking, I'm toast. And the faith that fueled his life's as a God's prophet is evaporating like dust in the wind. And he starts saying things like this, yep, I'm no better than anybody else. I'm just like every other Israelite who God delivered from Egypt and they're worshiping a golden calf. I'm just like them, trusting God for the impossible one day and running scared the next. It's a really bad comparison, but, but we do that. I do that. How much time do you spend looking at your phone? 
If you're the average North American, it adds up to a total of 49 days out of the year. <laughs> That's almost two months of your life each year, looking down at your phone, on average. We've never been so connected, and yet so lonely. Social media is probably the number one pipeline for perpetuating comparison and envy in your life right now. Think about this. So Elijah never had to worry about seeing what other prophets were posting about Baal on Instagram. He didn't have to read snarky comments from Jezebel's Facebook friends. He wasn't worried about looking in fury because of what the priests of Baal were wearing. He didn't have to worry about the Facebook police banning his post because of countercultural religious beliefs. He just compared himself to his ancestors and his imagination, and that was enough. Can you imagine how tormented Elijah would have been if he had a cell phone with him? This week, maybe you saw, it's on most of the channels, the Wall Street Journal, Journal reported that Facebook is aware that its popular app, Instagram, increases anxiety and depression among young users, especially girls. 32% of teen girls said that when they felt bad about their bodies, Instagram made them feel worse. And an adolescent psychologist commented, she said, young girls craft their identity based on how many likes they get and how they are perceived. And they get depressed and anxious for not measuring up. My heart goes out to the parents of teenagers and teenagers. It was tough for us growing up. Really tough these days. You know, I was talking to Mark Holmes, my friend, the other day, and he said, you know, he, back in the day, we would go to have recess and, recess and on the playground, the bullies would come after us. And now, and we could go home to get away from them, but now we go home, we take the bullies with us 24-7. Look at our phone. There they are. There's no safe place. Maybe you heard the latest news flash that Britney Spears is suspending her Instagram account indefinitely. She says, I'm going to live my real life for a while. I'm going to get engaged and married. I just want to be me. What's she saying? She says, what I post on Instagram is not a reflection of my real life. I don't belong here, and neither do you, any of you. Here's a solution. One good thing about Instagram, the cat videos. <laughs> or the dog videos. Follow Tucker, the golden retriever, Mark. Problem is, you might start comparing your beautiful golden retriever to Tucker and start wishing that yours was cuter and smarter and <laughs> had a more beautiful coat, then you really need help. But seriously, the real you doesn't belong here. Now, the best thing I'm going to say, next thing I'm going to say is going to sound really cliche, and it's going to sound like something an old guy would say in church. But it's true. Ready? God just wants you to be you because he made you that way. You don't have to be anybody else or better than anybody else to be accepted by Abba Father. And there's only one person on the planet you can be, and that is you. And that's enough. Because when we compare ourselves to other people, we get depressed. And the comparison trap always ends up reinforcing the same conclusion. We'll never be good enough, smart enough, wealthy enough, attractive enough, skinny enough, powerful enough, or special enough. But you are. You're a child of God created in his holy image. And grace accepts us where we are, not where we think we should be or Instagram thinks we should be. Watch Andrew's sermon from last week. This is a beautiful job of talking about Zacchaeus and how we have our identity in Christ. And then, of course, load up on the cat videos. And so we run, we cut ourselves off from others, and then we compare ourselves. And the fourth thing is we give up hope. In 1 Kings 19, 14, Elijah says, take my life. And I read that. I keep reading that over. And I, I said, you can't be serious. But you know, all the things he's doing are typical of severe depression. In fact, 1 Kings 19 conveys several different emotions that Elijah experienced. This is a recipe for depression. Elijah felt all of these. Fear. Elijah was afraid, verse 3. Desperation. I've had enough, verse 4. Low self-esteem, verse 4. I'm no better than anybody else. Anger and resentment. I work so hard for you, God, and what do I get? Nothing. Verse 10. Loneliness. I'm the only one left. Verse 10. Lethargy and laziness. Slept under a broom tree. Worry, anxiety, phobias. They're trying to kill me. Verse 10. And suicidal thoughts. Verse 4. 
And Elijah's going, check, 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 check. And I'm thinking, and maybe you're thinking, I can see Elijah running, cutting himself off from other people. But a titan of God wanting to die and actually wanting God to kill him? I mean, how do you get there? Listen to a podcast interview with two widows of <clears throat> two young pastors of large, vibrant evangelical churches in the United States who last year, COVID and a number of other things were just too much. It was kind of the last straw. And they actually took their lives. It was one of the most heartbreaking interviews I ever heard. I have a really, really good friend who was pastoring a large, large church. And uh, he's a vibrant, charismatic born leader. And he recently resigned out of the blue. I called him up and discovered he was crippled by anxiety attacks, dark valleys of depression. And, you know, far from the crowds, in the alone moments of his life, it was just too much to carry, and nobody knew. Nobody knew about his despair. Now, he's made it back, and he now leads a beautiful renewal ministry for other Elijahs, but there are many, sadly. Yeah. But, you know, even though we have the hope of heaven, the pain on earth can sometimes weigh too heavy. And the darkness of depression is real even when you are living in God's grace. Elijah tells that story. And no one's exempt. We're all vulnerable, some of you more than others. And if you ever do come to that last point on the list, wanting to end it all, you call 911. Don't even think twice. Or go, to, you know, go on Google and just put suicide hotline. A number pops up. You push it, someone will answer. Call us. We've had calls before. Our phone's there. Your life is too valuable, and too many people care about you. Just never act on your thoughts of suicide. Never, never. Well, let's wrap this up. As I look around this room, and I visualize many of you in your living rooms, most of you wearing your pajamas, you know. <laughs> but as I look around, and it's probably, you know, last week 300 came to service and 500 online, about 800 people. Uh, I, I see a few oak trees, but I see a lot of tulips too. And today, more than a few of you relate to this dark episode in Elijah's life, and you have a foreboding sense that things will never get better and then never change. But listen carefully. There's more to the story, and there's more to your story. And God refused to take Elijah's life. I mean, he could have, just another little zap of fire from heaven. That would have done it. But a premature death was not the answer. And I think that's one of the implicit messages in this narrative. But premature death is not the answer. It never is. But if you read on, you see Elijah finds a cave. And he lays down, he goes to sleep. And as he slept, an angel tapped him on the shoulder. And he said, get up, have something to eat, have a drink. And so he ate, drank, and he went back to sleep. And this happened several times. Interesting that God's remedy for Elijah's depression was physical rest and nourishment, not a scolding. And so Elijah ate, and he drank some more, and then he walked for another 40 days, just loading up the steps on that Fitbit, until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, where he prayed and complained some more. <laughs> and eventually God made himself known with a gentle whisper. And then God patiently listens to his lament. And in effect, he says, all right, okay. It's time to go back now. I have more for you to do. Okay, you ready? Let's do this. And so Elijah returned to Israel where he did continue his important ministry working for social justice and confronting evil. He mentored a young man named Elijah who would take his place, Elijah. And they became friends for life. And there's no record of Elijah being alone again. And then one day, hair now gray, God sent a chariot of fire to take Elijah directly to heaven. God answered his prayer and did take his physical life, in a manner of speaking, without Elijah even having to die, go straight to heaven. Pretty rare company there. It's probably not going to happen like that for you, but it's still going to be good. And I mean, all the great stuff following all that bad stuff, because God is faithful and he's patient, and he's always there even when we run from him. He's still chasing us. We move, he never does. We run, he's still there. Turn around, you'll lock eyes with a master, I guarantee it. 
Just think about what Elijah would have missed if he had cast in his chips and jumped off a cliff at Mount Horeb that day. <laughs> Don't quit. Friends, pain and darkness will not last forever. And this pandemic will have a shelf life. And so today, you know, eat, drink, and, and walk, and listen for the sound of his voice. The whisper of God is always in the air. Just listen for it. Know that the Lord is with you. And he's not done with you yet. God meets us where we are. But our response to him determines what happens next. So get help if, you, if you're feeling a twinge here. Get help. Call us. We'll help you. We have all kinds of support groups at the church for grief, addictions, life groups. Women have lots of groups. Come to Alpha online. <laughs> Take a spiritual gifts class from Tim eventually. Find a place to serve, a place to belong in that way. Children are always looking for volunteers. Youth and young adults, Nicole and Andrew, these are two people in whom the Spirit of God dwells, and nobody loves Jesus more than these two. If you're a kid or if you have kids or grandkids, get them into those groups in the Jesus-loving environment. We're all in this together, and there's no better place to navigate out of our caves of darkness and depression than in the company of others. So let's do this together. We are better together, as Carla said it three weeks ago. We can do this. We will do it. And with God's help and God's people. So let's do it. Let's do life together. Let's come together. Now more than ever do we need to come together. And I know you're with me on this journey, and I'm excited about what's going to happen, notwithstanding all this nonsense that's happening in our world. It's going to be a great year. Let me pray for you. And then we're going to listen to a beautiful song that ties all these things together. So, Lord, this morning we acknowledge that every single person fails. All of us. And all of us become discouraged, and many of us become depressed. And COVID amps that up, and we're feeling it. And sometimes we feel like we can't keep going. Look at our frailty and our failure and think we've blown it, and sometimes we even think we're disqualified from God's grace. How can I be like this if, you know, if there is a God? But terminal failure and disqualification is not how you work. And our failures don't define us. You do. And when discouragement comes, we acknowledge that your greatest desire is to heal and restore so that we can get back in the game. And you did this for Elijah. And we have to, and we will believe that you will do it for us. We are not finished until you say so. And I don't hear that coming from you anytime soon. And so begin even now in these closing moments of this service to begin and continue that good work in us. And may we see the light of Jesus, hear his voice, whisper his voice, and may we be encouraged today. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.
if the story isn't good Your failures never find a way And the father's in the road Failures never find a way a good song some seriously good lyrics there you're going to want to home and print that out it's called the father's house stick that in your journal or put it on the fridge loaded with great truth thank you so much for coming unfortunately when you leave the service you have to go to the parking lot to converse um, but you can't stop at that alpha cart and put your name down there if you want to sign up and grab one of those bookmarks that talks about the topics and the dates uh, and if you would like someone to pray with you we can do that over here. There's some people who just, that's what they love to do it. So don't leave here. Uh, you know, just don't run. <laughs> you know, talk to somebody if you feel something prompting in your heart. And until we see you again, may God bless you. And may he make his face to smile upon you and be gracious unto you. And give you lots and grace and peace this week. And may he turn your tulips into oak trees. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day.